what's more important, when to eat or what to eat, especially when we're looking at chronic disease and inflammation and weight weight loss? I think it's a tough question because it's almost asking you to choose between two, one out of your two kids. So I guess both are important, but at, uh, at the same time, imagine that the good quality food is your best friend. And if that best friend shows up on time when you are free, then that's good. But if the best friend shows up, mm. knocks on your door every night at one o'clock in the morning, then that person may not be that person may not be your best friend. So the point is yeah. timing can make good food junk. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why. Wait, wait, say that again. Timing can make good food junk. Can it do the opposite? Can it make junk food good? So I won't say that it can make the junk food good, but what I can say is it can lessen the bad effect of junk food. It can lessen the bad effect of junk food because the timing, depending on what time you're eating relative to fasting, timing can turn on many defense mechanisms in our body, including genes that detoxify bad things in junk Mm. food. So that's why I said that timing can lessen the bad effect of junk food. Right, which doesn't give us a free pass for junk food. I just just want to point that out. But it is an interesting, uh, you know, a lot of the um, research that you've done, I have poured myself into. And one of the conclusions I've come um, out of your research and really thought deeply about is if we have such poor quality food and the food industry is profiting from this poor quality food, there's no incentive for the food industry to change. So therefore, the best tool we can give people for, again, for weight loss and inflammation and metabolic health is, okay, just take that toxic food and let's compress it into one eating window so that you have a longer period for your body to rest so that, like you said, the genes can turn on, but it can also heal yeah. from the toxicity of food. Am I am I thinking that yeah, through that's right? that's true. I mean, one caveat I must say from the beginning is most of the stuff that I'll be talking about, about genes, biochemistry, proteins or detoxification, all of these are done in laboratory mouse models because that's where we can actually go Mm. look deeply into all these factors. We can also give the mice healthy food or junk food at different time of the day. And very systematically, methodically, we can look at every single gene in the mouse genome. And in fact, we share almost 99% of the genes with mouse. So that's why a lot of this can be translated to humans. In fact, every single medication, supplements, everything that we eat, that we take to manage, prevent, or cure any disease were tested at some point in mice or many laboratory animals. So with that caveat, <laughs> I will, most of the biochemical stuff or genetic stuff that I'll talk about mostly comes from laboratory stuff. You actually bring up a really valid point because in the world of science, I feel like a lot of times people will dismiss a good study because it was a mouse study. And they say, well, this is a better study because it was a human study. And then we have this new emerging question, which is, but the human studies aren't necessarily being done on on the same demographic, like women aren't separated out. And like I've read some intermittent fasting studies where they had a, a, a cohort that had 17-year-old men all the way up to 55-year-old women. And I'm like, you should never look at a metabolic system of a 17-year-old man and compare it to a 55-year-old woman. So just for the, for the people listening, do you feel like we need more human studies or do you feel like the mouse studies really are giving us enough information of how to look at some of this behavior for ourselves? Well, the mouse studies give us uh, some clue that it might work in humans, but we have to do these studies in mm-hmm. humans because ultimately we're doing all this research not to make mice healthier, they're already healthy, but to make humans healthier and live a long productive life. So we do have to go back to humans and do these studies. But at the same time, for example, when I talk about time restricted eating or fasting or anything that we do in the lab and we say, what happens in the liver? 
And in that case, mm -hmm. we're actually going and looking at liver biopsy samples in mice, which will be almost impossible to do in humans, particularly if you're not having yes. fatty liver disease and if your liver is not a threat, nobody is going to give a, I won't give a piece of my liver for <laughs> simple biopsy. Yes, so I would So that's <laughs> why we have to keep that in context. Like when we're talking mm -hmm. about what is the I impact like of certain things, medication or supplements or lifestyle on internal organs that are very difficult or almost impossible to sample. For example, we can also look at impact of time restricted feeding or intermittent fasting on brain health. By looking at different parts of the brain, there is mm -hmm. no way we can do that study on humans. But no. these studies actually tell us okay, is there enough changes that we see in laboratory studies to begin to ask this question in humans? Because usually the rule of thumb is if it doesn't help a mouse, it's less likely that it will help a human. You know, the way I always say it is animal studies get us in the ballpark, then we've got to decide what seat we're going to sit at. And so I, I'm a big fan of N of one, figuring out how to take these studies like the ones you're doing and how do we make them applicable to our own life.